In this video lecture, we're going to delve deeper into defining what strategy is and exploring a little more in detail about strategic management processes. Here is the agenda for the video lecture. As I mentioned, first we'll get into more detail about what is strategy. Then we're going to discuss the context in which strategy takes place, including internal and external to the firm. And then we'll focus on the nature of strategic management processes within public corporations. This set of definitions is the same one as we saw on the first day of class. These are some very basic definitions of what, how people have defined strategy. I want to call your attention to the last one that is the, from our Rothamel text. Strategy is the goal-directed actions a firm intends to take in its quest to gain and sustain competitive advantage, where competitive advantage is defined as superior performance relative to industry competitors. This is the working definition we will use for the semester. In this slide, we're going to discuss a little more detail behind that working definition. First, strategy is a quest or a journey to gain and sustain competitive advantage. The importance here is sustaining it over the long term. So we're looking at superior performance relative to the rivals over the long term. However, as the second point mentions, managers have different beliefs about how this is done. That leads to different viewpoints and different potential strategies to achieve this competitive advantage. What's important is that strategy is about being different from your rivals. It is about deciding what to do, what should the firm do in terms of the who, what, and how that we discussed. Who is the target customers? What is the need being satisfied of those customers? And then how refers to the core competence or unique strength that the firm has. So that who, what, how question is the idea behind strategy is, being, is having a who, what, how position in the market that is different from the rivals. And in creating that who, what, how position, you are deciding what your firm is going to do, but also what your firm is not going to do. Because once you define those specific answers to those three questions, you're also stating what you're not doing. And, and for example, once you define your target customer as, say, upper income uh, urban professionals, then you're defining that you're not going to focus on other customer groups. And it's important to recognize that once you formalize these strategic definitions or these strategic um, positioning aspects, you are also creating constraints as to what, where, and how you can grow. Strategy also involves combining a set of activities to stake out that unique who, what, and how position. As I mentioned, it's a quest to gain competitive advantage that in, in the previous definition we talked about actions and goal-directed actions. Those actions are these set of activities, and they should all be directed towards that unique position. So once you have defined your target market, you have defined the need you're satisfying, and you've defined your core competency, the activities that the firm undertakes should all focus on those three positioning aspects. And finally, as we mentioned in our first class, strategy requires long-term commitments. And once you make those commitments in terms of investing money, people, time, and effort towards a, a pathway or a specific strategy, those are difficult to reverse or undo. And those that's what creates constraints, because once you've made those commitments and you've pushed the firm in a specific direction to satisfy a specific set of customers, it's, it's very difficult both from a uh, customer standpoint, but also from an investment standpoint, it's very difficult to change those commitments. As a result, that's locking the firm into a specific trajectory. You saw this slide during the first day of class, and I want to just reiterate it here. As we've discussed, strategy is about a unique position, which is performing different activities or performing similar activities in different ways that creates a distinct position along that frontier it leads to a different position from rivals. Again, it leads to a different answer to the who, what, and how questions. It is important to note strategy is not about operational effectiveness. It is not about benchmarking. It is not about optimization and moving towards that productivity frontier. Benchmarking and optimization tend to lead to rivals becoming more similar. Strategy wants the exact opposite. Strategy is about being different from your rivals so that customers will have a reason to choose you over your rival firm. 
this slide goes a little bit further into that unique positioning. Again, strategy is about a unique and valuable position and deliberately choosing those activities. However, as mentioned, it does involve the trade-offs. If I am going to, for example, focus on providing uh, providing a, for example, an automobile at low cost, which would be the upper left-hand side of this curve, that is going to constrain my ability to offer a highly differentiated product, which are typically unique luxury items. If I'm focusing on cost, it's going to be hard for me to offer a luxury item that a customer will be willing to pay for. So once you've staked out your position on this curve, again by specifying who, what, and how, once you've identified that position, it's hard to move. For example, a company like Hyundai, who has long been known for their value-oriented automobiles, Hyundai is trying to move up market and become more of a premium price product. However, because all of their activities and, and the customer perceptions are all designed around a value priced automobile, the customer is unwilling to pay a premium price and therefore Hyundai is somewhat limited in their ability to move up market. We want to talk a little bit more about where these strategic positions come from. And the basis really is, is that there are two types of advantage here in strategy, two basic types of advantage. One is a cost advantage and the other is differentiation advantage. A cost advantage says that one firm is able to perform activities more efficiently or for a lower cost, whether that's because of economies of scale or location economies, or they're able to, they have processes or technology that allows them to do something for cheaper. But a cost advantage means they will compete on the left hand, upper left-hand side of this curve, and usually that cost advantage allows them to sell their products or services at lower prices. Companies that typically work from a cost advantage are companies like Kia, Walmart, uh, Hyundai, for example, and if you think about also uh, maybe in a supermarket chain like Aldi or something like that. The other type of advantage is a differentiation advantage where rather than perform activities more efficiently, we're performing different activities or we're performing similar activities in different ways, and this is, creates a uniqueness. These firms tend to operate on the bottom right-hand side of the curve. And think of it this way, as a firm is offering something unique or different that the customer is willing to pay a premium price for. So, for example, we talked about Starbucks and, and a premium price coffee because of their unique image and their unique environment in the coffee shops. If we think about automobiles, we're thinking about companies here like a BMW or maybe even going to the higher end, a Porsche or a Ferrari, who offer you really unique products and the customers pay a very high premium for it. And in the fashion world, you can think about things like Gucci or Prada, who offer really unique high-end luxury items, and those operate, on again, on the right bottom right-hand side of this frontier. The second part is where do these positioning things come from? We're not going to focus much on this, but you can see firms can choose to... Um, use a subset of products where they have a narrow product line as their source of positioning. Or they may focus on specific needs, getting back to that what question and the who, what, and how. Or finally, the access. They may target specific customers that can only be reached in certain ways. And here, think about something like Uber, where Uber really only focuses on a certain type of customer who access the ride sharing through mobile phones and there are a whole generation of folks who use taxis who do not use Uber because they don't use the apps like that and don't know how to or may not or choose not to. Now that you've got some basics behind what is strategy and its strategic positioning, a few final quick thoughts here. One, maintaining a good strategy and maintaining a consistent strategy requires that the firm be disciplined, that they choose their who, what, and how that we talked about, and they stick to that. And they only change that when absolutely necessary or when they intentionally decide to change. And that their who, what, and how needs to be communicated to internally to their employees, but also externally to their customers. They want to be able to show their customers who the firm is focusing on and what they're providing and what their source of uniqueness is. This requires a tailored system of activities, and once you tailor an entire system of activities around a specific position, 
any shift in that position becomes costly or difficult. Thus, any tie, anytime firms try to grow out of their uh, strategic position by adding new product lines or adding features that are inconsistent with their current position, they are damaging their own positioning. Often the ways to make a strategic position or a strategic you know, a set of answers to that who, what, and how more profitable involve de either deepening their position or focusing on those customers more uh, with more effort and more satisfying more of those customers' needs or globalizing or maybe maybe going after a different uh, a different industry that matches those same customers. And we'll get more into these last few points as we get, go further into the semester later on, um, sometime towards the, the final third of the semester. It's also worth noting why strategy is important. This graph talks about um, research has shown, if we think about how we explain firm performance, roughly 20% of a firm's performance over history it can be explained by the industry the firm is in. So that's the green the green block here. So just by being in a specific industry, certain structural characteristics of that industry explain about 20% of the firm's performance. You can see then firm effects are about 30 to 45% of the firm's performance. And by firm effects, we mean specific things about the firm, such as the resources they have, and in particular, their strategy. So that's the, the blue, the blue um, portion of the pie here. And then the yellow represents the other effects, where um, they're roughly 35 to 50%. And those are things that we can't explain, or they're tied to the year, such as the macroeconomic situation, or maybe it's because they're part of a larger corporate parent uh, and that they have certain benefits that explain their performance. But what we want to draw your attention to is that firm effects such as firm strategy uh, roughly explain 30 to 45 percent. So that's why we spend a lot of time in the first half of the semester focusing on the firm and we'll focus on trying to understand why, what makes one firm different from another in terms of their strategic positioning. It's also worth noting that, as I mentioned in the first class, there are different types of strategies. I mentioned in the first class there are two questions we're going to focus on. How can a firm compete within a specific industry? And that's the green level here, the SBU level or strategic business unit level, where we talk about within a specific industry, how does a, either a firm or a division of a firm compete? And above the green, you'll notice there is the corporate headquarters, the where to compete. This level talks about which industries. Now, if we are a firm that competes only in one industry, say Domino's Pizza, they're only, they don't have a corporate strategy because they are focused on one industry. So they're really just focusing on how to compete within that industry of quick service food. However, if we think of a company like Siemens or General Electric, they have a corporate strategy which decides which industries they should be in, which divisions they should maintain, expand, or, or maybe get rid of. And then for each division or each business unit, they then have to compete within the, the industry, and that is where strategic positioning comes in. The unique strategic position we've been talking about is what occurs at that green level, the how we compete within a specific industry. It's important to note that all this discussion of strategy, the strategy occurs within the context of the environment that the firm operates in. And you can see here the firm is in the middle between internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Now a stakeholder is anyone who has a claim against the firm. And broadly we can say a claim are things like the firm owes something or is perceived to owe something to that in individual or organization. So on the right-hand side, you can see internal stakeholders consist of employees, stockholders, and board members. And we might also put managers in there because the managers may be considered separate from employees in terms of uh, compensation and rights and responsibilities. So on the right-hand side, you have internal stakeholders or people who have a claim to the firm's assets, the firm's profits, the firm's attention uh, from inside the firm. On the left-hand side in the blue box, you can see Outside the firm, there are a number of 
entities or individuals who have claims as well. You have customers, you have suppliers, you have partners, you have creditors or people who've lent the firm money, uh, labor unions, the communities in which the firm operates, and then the government. And if you think each one of these has a different claim on the, the organization or the firm, and it's important to note that the, each of these external stakeholders has a different claim, but also internal stakeholders. For example, the, the, what the employees want from the firm or demand from the firm is different than what stockholders do. Employees may want higher pay or better benefits or more job security, whereas stockholders, they're focusing on financial returns. And any firm strategy has to try to satisfy some of these stakeholders, recognizing the fact that no strategy is going to satisfy all of these stakeholders. Uh, there, there are always people who want something different or want something more from the firm, or, and, and as a result, it's very difficult to design a strategy that is going to satisfy all the stakeholders. As a result, CEOs and top management need to prioritize which stakeholders are going to be given priority. And in, in our case, the, as I mentioned in the first class, we're focusing on publicly traded U.S. corporations. Usually it's the shareholders or stockholders who are given preference. And this is usually evident in the firm's vision, vision statement or mission statement, where they will typically identify uh, often not, maybe not in direct words, but often through phrasing which firm or which entity or which organization uh, in terms of stakeholders gets their priority. And so, for, uh, for example, you'll often see mission statements that talk about a desire to create superior customer value. That usually means the customer may be first or superior profitability may be the, the shareholder is first. But it's important to note the firm operates in an environment of many stakeholders and at various points these stakeholders may gain or lose power ba based on what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the firm and what's happening in the industry and as a result the firm may have to adapt its strategies as stakeholder preferences and stakeholder power changes. With these different stakeholders in mind it's now worthwhile to talk a little bit about the firm's objectives. The strategy or the definition of strategy we discussed was goal-oriented actions. So we have to start in saying what is the organization's goal? The firm usually identifies this objective by specifying its vision, mission, and values to the public, to, the, to its various stakeholders. The vision is a very broad statement. It is ultimately what does the firm want to try to accomplish? What is their ultimate goal? What is their ultimate objective? And these are usually fairly lofty statements, uh, often general in nature, but they will specify some end objective in mind. The mission then talks about how the firm or what the firm is going to be about in terms of prioritizing those stakeholders and the way it approaches its business. Um, and then the values will then talk about the specific actions um, or the specific approaches the firm will use. And many times uh, in practice, most firms will identify a vision and a mission. Uh, the value statements may not always be made public. However, within an, an organization, uh, the internal stakeholders, the employees, the board of directors, and the stockholders often know what these values are. And it's important to note that, again, going back to a strategy is a set of goal-directed actions. The strategy needs to be based upon what the vision, mission, and values of the firm is, and they, sh they should all be consistent. Where firms get into trouble is when they have inconsistencies between their vision and mission and values and their strategy. And so they may be saying one thing but doing another, or they may be stating one objective but their strategy actually isn't designed to achieve that objective. And in those, cases, in those cases of mismatching or misalignment, that's when stakeholders really begin to voice their displeasure. And the more powerful the stakeholder, the more problems it could create. Thus, firms often want to really think hard about what is our vision, what is our mission, and what are the values we need to get there. This should be done before the strategy is designed because the strategy should support the vision, mission, and values. At this point, it's now helpful to now 
start to think about where we're going in the semester now that we've defined strategy and the context in which strategy operates we now want to start thinking about our approach for the semester and how we're going to understand firm strategy and we're going to delve into understanding and applying strategy concepts typically strategy is done f first through analysis and so most firms before they create a strategy they do an external and internal analysis to understand what's going on in the industry, what's going on in the macro economy, and then also what's going in on inside the firm to understand where we are today, what's the current situation. The second step is to then formulate strategies, whether it's business or corporate strategy, to achieve the objectives that the firm is trying to pursue. And then once the strategy is formulated, then it's up to the organizational design and corporate governance, these actions that the firm has to now implement the strategy. So it's important that the design and governance systems, again, fit with what the firm is trying to do. And so this process of analysis, formulation, and implementation is a it's a step-by-step -step process. However, uh, it's a not a linear process. Typically, the firm will analyze, then they'll try and formulate a strategy. They may try and implement it, and they may run into problems, so they may have to go back to formulation. Or new events may occur, so they have to go back and spend more time on analysis. So it's not a linear process, but these are the three major steps that generally occur in this order with some, with some repetition or return to the prior step. This AFI... Uh, approach of Roth and Mel maps well onto traditional strategic planning processes. It's typically referred to as the rational planning or top-down approach, where first the top management defines the mission, vision, and goal, then they conduct external analysis, internal analysis, and create strategic fit or alignment through SWOT, and then they formulate an appropriate strategy and then implement that strategy and monitor performance, and they'll adapt if performance fails to meet their expectations. Such a top-down or traditional approach is most applicable only in stable environments uh, or, or environments that are relatively stable. If there's a lot of volatility or if there's a lot of uncertainty um, or major industry changes, such a top-down approach may be too slow and too restrictive. And so other approaches to strategy uh, or strategic management processes are involved. When the firm does face a lot of volatility or uncertainty, uh, one of the approaches is scenario planning. And we'll deal more with this later in the semester, but basically the idea of a scenario plan is to envision different potential futures and think creatively, well, what would the firm have to do if, that, if a future looked like this? So, for example, if we think about driverless vehicles as a future scenario that may happen, um, what would that future look like if you were an automobile insurer, right? Think about the nature of how automobile insurance would change if the, the cars are driven by computers and not by humans. And what would you be insuring? And, and would you be insuring a, a person, a car, a computer? And how would that work in the industry? And that, that's one way to think about what if plans when we're dealing with unknown futures, we have to generate different potential scenarios and then think, what would the firm have to do in each different scenario? And it really is uh, something that is a very creative uh, process that involves a lot of brainstorming, a lot of um, back and forth what if discussions and a lot of explorations. And then the firm then tries to think, okay, if that's what some of the potential futures are, how do we best prepare for them? And we'll do an exercise later in the semester that has to deal with scenario planning. Okay, wrapping up this, this video lecture for this, these two chapters about what is strategy and strategic management processes, I just want to draw your, your eyes to a few key takeaways. One, there are multiple levels of strategy. So if strategy is a goal-directed set of actions, we're going to talk about different types of strategy. The two we're going to focus the most on are the business level strategy, which is how to compete within a specific industry, and then corporate level strategy, which is which industry should we be involved in or which markets. The first step is creating a goal, the vision, mission, and values that provide a motivation and a direction for your employees and your internal stakeholders, but also communicate these to your external stakeholders. 
The traditional strategy process again involves analysis, formulation, implementation, and that continuous cycle. However, it's, it's worth noting that in real life strategy is a little less linear and less straightforward. And this isn't the only approach to strategy. Multiple strategic processes do exist, such as scenario planning or what some would call emergent strategy, where it's much more of a reactionary or flexible strategy or what may call organic strategy. And so what we'll do over the course of the semester is start to delve further into these processes of analysis, formulation, and implementation. I want you to, to, to keep in mind, though, that we first have to think about what is the goal of the firm? What, what goal are we aiming at before we get into those goal-directed strategies?